Okay, we're recording. Welcome everyone to today's webinar. My name is Joe Tata. I'm a physical therapist. It's a pleasure to be here with you and to be sharing this time on a Saturday afternoon. I'm grateful that you're all here. And I'm super excited to see um, a, a safe place really where lots of different types of practitioners as well as people who are looking for solutions to pain can come and learn and share information with each other. Of course, we're going to talk about mindfulness today and how it can be used for pain just as a um, and FYI, this primarily is a webinar for licensed health professionals. If you are a con what's considered a consumer or someone looking for information, you're definitely welcome to spend time here with us and to join us in learning. Just know that anything I say on this webinar is for educational purposes only and is not intended to diagnose or treat any health condition. Always make sure to consult with a physician or another licensed medical professional before you make any changes to your health and wellness based on things that you see online. So here are the learning objectives for the day. Uh, just three basic learning objectives I have for you. So the first is to review the evidence that supports mindfulness for pain relief or pain reduction. Describe the unique cognitive change processes at work in mindfulness-based interventions. And then des describe the essential components of a mindfulness-based pain relief program. I'll go through that more toward the end so you might be thinking, you know, the reason why I took that poll is to see how many of you have a mindfulness practice. Obviously, if you're here, you have some interest or you'd like to learn about mindfulness. These are some of the reasons why I've chosen mindfulness and mindfulness-based interventions. And I share them with you as you start to journey into the world of mindfulness, that mindfulness, for the most part, is a safe inter intervention. Um, there are relatively few side effects, and the few side effects that there are are quite small and they're quite easily uh, mitigated in practice when you're working with the patient, um, if you know what you're doing. They're effective. So there's lots of evidence behind them of, of uh, being effective for both um, mental health or mental well being as well as physical well being. Um, you can deliver these at the point of care. So no matter what type of practitioner you are, um, any of the practitioners that um, are here today on, on this webinar, whether you work in an inpatient setting or an outpatient setting, whether you work um, at the end of end of care, um, end of life care, they're useful there. They're useful in women's health, they're useful in orthopedic and sports physical therapy. They fit easily into all of our personal scope of practice. So no matter what type of professional you are, this fits into your both your uh, professional and your personal scope. So there's a distinction between professional and personal scope. Professional scope is what your board says you can or can't do. Um, I have yet to come across any type of licensed health board that says you can't use mindfulness in practice. And then personal scope wise, just like everything else you've learned in university training and outside of university training, you have to spend some time and develop some skill on it, um, practice it on yourself, practice it with your peers, and then you begin to use it with um, patients and clients, and then you um, gain expertise and competence with regard to the skill. So these are some of the reasons why I've chosen mindfulness. Now, I do think it's important to just kind of keep the person with pain in mind as we go into this webinar. There are significant reasons why people choose mindfulness. Of course, they're reading things on the news and on social media and trying apps and all sorts of things like that. But kind of the, the two biggest as far as um, physical, let's just say physical health outcomes are pain relief and sleep. And those are two vitally important parts of treating someone with chronic pain. Um, mindfulness has been shown or demonstrated to have um, significant effects on both pain and sleep. It's approachable and it's free from social stigma. Um, number three and four. Now, if you know me and you know my work, I'm a big advocate of the mental health um, industry and it's something we desperately need after the year we've been in right now. When you look at some of the leading indicators placed out by the CDC, um, our mental health and wellness is going in the opposite direction. Um, I always encourage people to explore mental health um, providers and interventions. Now, just like with physical health interventions, sometimes people aren't ready for that. And they're looking for other ways in, so to speak. And mindfulness can be a nice way to allow people in. I've had many patients where I've trained them on mindfulness. And from there, because they're exploring their own mind, they're exploring their own thoughts and feelings and emotions and how it impacts their life, they eventually, many patients will eventually go seek out, um, you know, a psychologist or a counselor or a social worker or something like that. But this could be a nice kind of gentle way for them to start exploring 
some of these topics uh, free from the social stigma that's out there with regard to mental health. Obviously promotes mental as well as physical well-being. And then there is definitely that aging population that we're all seeing right now. So they're looking for ways to stay healthy and vital. So there's lots of studies on mindfulness with regard um, to longevity and telomere lengthening. So the kind of ends of your um, DNA, that a certain amount of mindfulness training helps with that memory and longevity and cognition. So you can take a screenshot of this if you're a practitioner. And this is important for you to be able to talk, talk to your patients about. I also think it's important that you put some of this information maybe on your website or on forward-facing material that you share with other practitioners or the public, because people want to know, why should I choose mindfulness? I've heard about it. I'm not sure about it. Kind of sounds a little weird or funny to me, but here are the reasons why most people choose it. Um, just a definition of mindfulness. I really like to kind of demystify things. As health practitioners, our vocabulary is very rich and at times very complicated. So when you're describing mindfulness to patients, or even if you're potentially giving a lecture, you can use this. It's simply a mental training that aims to improve a health-related outcome. Most of those health-related outcomes, when you look at them in the literature, are psychologically-based health outcomes, but not all of them. Some of them are, are physically-based and even related to biomarkers as well. But mindfulness is basically just a mental training. I'm particularly fond, I'm fond of the word mental training because when someone comes to see me, they're expecting some type of quote unquote physical therapy or physical training. They're not necessarily expecting, expecting a mental training. Um, they're not necessarily expecting mindfulness, but I like to say, well, we're going to train both your mind and your body. And when we train both your mind and your body, that's the best evidence to helping you overcome some of the challenges that you're having. So mindfulness is a state. It's, you've often heard this, this non-judgmental, non-reactive, aware, open, present-centered present state. It's a trait that can be described as a pattern of cognition or emotion. It's a practice in and of itself. It's an intervention. And then for many people, once you begin to study mindfulness and you see the positive effects on it, um, you become very excited about it and it becomes almost a way of living. And I talk about this more and more. I really encourage mindfulness because I feel that not only do we need this in chronic pain, but we need this in our greater society as a way to live. Now, when you begin to train this state, this intervention, this way of living, ultimately what we're doing is we're training nervous system or in essence, we're training um, homeostasis throughout the whole body. I don't wanna just say nervous system, we put a lot of emphasis on the nervous system with pain because um, that's kind of where the research is right now. But I really want to take a completely patient-centered approach, a, a, a whole approach, if you will. Mindfulness has many different outcomes with regard to um, the homeostasis of the human body, both the physical as well as the psychological and the emotional. Now, why should we turn to mindfulness as practitioners? Well, as the research rolls out about the human nervous system, the brain, and we're both looking at the brain with functional MRIs and learning to assess it in other ways outside of fancy pictures and scans. We're really seeing that so many different areas of the brain are involved with pain. And sometimes that's what makes pain so challenging to, to, to treat. So if you're just using one intervention, um, it doesn't do it so well. It's, it's not a great way to approach pain. We need treatments that target multiple parts of the brain. And in targeting multiple parts of the brain, we're in essence targeting multiple processes. So it's not just, and I don't, I don't you know, we hear things in media about, well, it shuts down your amygdala. And that's not true. We don't shut down the amygdala. We help all the other parts of the brain communicate effectively with the amygdala and the medial prefrontal cortex and all the other parts of the brain and in essence, we're synchronizing um, an output of the brain in a more healthy way. Now, when we do that, then we use these types of interventions, mindfulness being one of them. It has an effect on our cognitions, our emotions, and our behavior. And mindfulness specifically has an impact on mood and pain. So again, what's nice about mindfulness is you're targeting multiple parts of the brain or, or nervous system, if you will. Um, how does mindfulness work? There are three key ways that mindfulness works. First, it's cognitive control. The second is emotion regulation. 
And the third is self-awareness. So we'll kind of go through these just briefly. Cognitive control. So with, like, for example, with catastrophization, right? With pain catastrophizing, there's this um, hooking, if you will, of the mind, and it draws your awareness away from the present moment and toward pain. And what we learn to do with mindfulness-based interventions is to simply guide that present moment awareness back. Oftentimes it's to the breath, it doesn't have to be the, the breath. It can be your heartbeat, it can be an external object like a candle or a spot on the floor. But we're, tra we're training that awareness and that ability to guide um, that present center of the moment uh, awareness back to the, the present moment. Um, we also work on emotion regulation. So with mindfulness, we explore not only our thoughts, but also our emotions and our physical sensations in our body. Um, in essence, cognition is embodied. So your thoughts have an impact on your physical body and what you feel on your physical body. So when, uh, you know, acceptance is a big part of mindfulness work. And with that, there's emotion regulation um, that goes along with that. And then finally is the self-awareness. So self-awareness relates directly to both cognitive control and emotion regulation. So do I, do I have the self-awareness to guide my attention or to guide my cognition back to the place I want it? Notice the challenging content of my thoughts and emotions and physical sensations, bring that self-awareness in and then choose to do things um, that are either in line or out of line with my intentions in the moment. So we're talking about intentions in mindfulness. Um, kind of building those cognitive mechanisms out more, as I just mentioned, there's a, an intention, motivation, um, connection in mindfulness. So oftentimes you hear people um, set an intention, like my intention is to start a healthy diet for the new year. And they're all motivated in the beginning for that. And then within about a couple of days, it's gone. And the reason why that is, is because there, there's a lack of mindfulness skills. So as the days and weeks go on, and you become your attention, if you will, becomes uh, drawn away from that initial intention, and you start to succumb to things like yearnings and cravings and urges for foods. With mindfulness, it can help keep us connected to that intention because an intention is a present moment awareness. It's what's happening right now in the present moment. If we can connect to that, then it, oftentimes it helps us with motivation, helps us with behavior change. Uh, a big part of that is decentering. Um, decentering is the term they use in traditional mindfulness. Diffusion is what's used in uh, an approach like acceptance and commitment therapy. There's lots of different um, terminology. If you go into literature, you'll probably find over a hundred different ways of just saying or teaching people how they can think about their own thinking. So mindfulness, teaches you how to think about your own thinking or think about your own emotions and feelings, if you will. Now with that, through that training, there's a non-attachment to your thoughts, emotions, and physical sensations. With that non-attachment, something happens, right, in our brain. And we already spoke about emotion regulation and I already mentioned um, the training and cultivation of awareness and attention. So some of the more common mechanisms with regard to mindfulness-based training. Some of the more important ones that I'd like to uh, bring to light with regard to mindfulness, specifically with chronic pain, um, the, the first two bullets really relate to each other. The extinction, or actually the first three bullets there, the extinction of fear conditioning. Mindfulness is an acceptance-based st coping strategy for pain, and there's a disengagement from pain-related threats. So those three kind of all point to each other. So as you develop ac acceptance, um, and you disengage from pain-related content, it helps with that extinction of fear. I, don't, I, don't, I personally don't believe these things extinguish 100%. We just change how we relate to it. Um, there are natural opioids released in the nervous system, and there are also anti-inflammatory substrates in the periphery that lead to positive changes in people. So those are some of the biomarkers. I think perhaps the most important one for us all to look at is the last one there, is it strengthens one's ability to appraise nociception. Oftentimes what happens with people who have chronic pain is they don't like to um, bring their awareness and their attention to the things they're feeling in their body. Because they know when I bring my awareness and my attention to my body, the first place my awareness and attention goes is to my pain. 
And once my awareness and, and attention lands on my pain, then my mind starts going and my pain gets worse. So through mindfulness training, we help people appraise what they're feeling in their body. And in essence, we help them reappraise um, challenging bodily sensations or what we know is nociception. That last bullet is probably the, um, I really think kind of the, the you know, the linchpin of, of mindfulness mechanisms um, for chronic pain. Um, just down here in the bottom of the slide, this is a, a meta-analysis uh, from 2004. I try to keep things very recent. It's a little bit older, but mindfulness now in one way or another has been treated for almost every health condition that is um, comorbidly related to chronic pain disorders. I, don't have, I can't fit them all on the screen here. And of course, I don't have time to talk about them all today, but there's positive support for all these. So what's nice about this is so often our patients struggle not only with autoimmune disease, but they also have diabetes. Not only with anxiety, but they also have chronic pelvic pain. So what's nice about this is mindfulness has been studied in many and all of these and shows effectiveness. So it's what they call um, trans diagnostic. So a, an approach like this cuts across one or multiple conditions, which I think is really important when we're looking at the chronic pain population of patients we're working with. The great thing about social media is we get to spread information. The bad thing about social media is sometimes that's not the highest quality information. So when people first find mindfulness, there are lots of preconceived ideas about what's going to happen when they sit down and they close their eyes. And these are important to talk about people in the beginning. Um, I definitely debrief on this when, I, when I'm working with someone who has never um, interacted with mindfulness, because of course these are not truths or partial truths, so to speak. Um, and they're also, some of these are the barriers that prevent people from, uh, from engaging with a mindfulness practice. So for example, mindfulness is having no thoughts or stopping thoughts. Um, I actually heard a, a podcast of um, Deepak Chopra a couple of weeks ago, and I love Deepak. I think he's done great things for the mindfulness-based world, except on this podcast, which is a very, on a very famous platform, probably being listened to by hundreds and potentially millions of people. He actually said mindfulness is a way to stop your thoughts. And I was just kind of floored when I heard that because people engage in mindfulness in their first Oftentimes their, their first challenge is my mind just racing. I can't stop my mind from thinking. And, you know, it's like this wild racehorse. We want to tame it. And that's not necessarily what we're doing with mindfulness. Yes, there's a, an essence of peaceful abiding with mindfulness that is there, but we're not stopping thoughts. We're learning how to step back and look at the content of our mind and begin to work with that in ways that are healthy. Does mindfulness sometimes slow down thought to stop thoughts? Sure, it does. Sometimes. And other days you sit down and you have some work to do as your mind is, is racing. I think all of us probably, at least those of us here in the United States, may have experienced that over the past week with all the things that are happening um, in the world of politics, right? Um, so these are, these are really important uh, myths to, to bust for people, if you will. And it helps them then approach mindfulness in a way that they don't feel like they're failing or doing it wrong. And that's probably the biggest take home um, of this, this one slide here. So let's talk about some of the evidence. Um, as, as you look at the evidence, I always encourage you not to just look at this as a single paper, but also to keep in mind, um, I'm coming from this from my own clinical experience, you're approaching it from your own clinical experience, and then we're keeping our patient in mind as we look at research. That's an evidence-based approach to care. It's not just the hottest paper that was just released. That's great, we like, we like that, and I wanna see more research, we all want that. But there are a lot of things we see um, that don't necessarily translate to practice very well. Uh, mindfulness actually, I'll show you in a couple minutes, actually translates to practice beautifully. Um, so the first, this was a Systematic Review and Meta-Analysis from the Annals of Behavioral Medicine, 2017. So this is very recent. And they looked at mindfulness compared to treatment as usual. Treatment as usual in this study was pain medication, various types of pain medications, um, pharmacotherapy, if you will. Um, passive controls, education, which is important because we talk about pain neuroscience education often as physiotherapists and other professionals, and then support groups. Um, so 
it, mindfulness was associated with improvements compared to those that I just mentioned. What's really interesting about this study, I think the biggest takeaway from this study is the efficacy of mindfulness meditation on pain did not differ by the type of mindfulness intervention. I think that's really important. So really what it, it probably goes to tell us is that it's most important that we begin to engage people in this practice. And then over time, we can worry about, okay, what did I, do I use mindfulness of the body today? Do I use compassion today? Do I use intention training today? Do I use emotion regulation today? You have to use all those. And I'll show you a, a framework that I've developed for this later. But I think the most important part is we need to get this going, right? We need to, to grease the spokes, if you will, and begin to use this and not worry about like, what's the best perfect mindfulness intervention out there. Um, and then finally, mindfulness was associated with significant improvements in both physical um, quality of life, as well as mental health related quality of life. This is a um, article from 2016. It was a randomized control trial that compared mindfulness based stress reduction to cognitive behavioral therapy for those with chronic lower back pain. They found at the end of this randomized control trial that mindfulness had significantly greater reductions in pain catastrophizing compared to CBT in this particular trial. I think it's interesting because for those who don't want to engage in a traditional CBT approach or for professionals who don't want to learn CBT or feel like it's a little bit outside their scope, just know that mindfulness can have a greater impact or at least an equivalent impact on pain catastrophizing. And pain catastrophizing is one of the most important mediators with regard to um, chronic pain. Another um, part of this paper that I really liked is they followed these participants out over 52 weeks. Most of the um, cognitive interventions that are used for people with chronic pain only follow people for maybe three weeks. So there's definitely a waning period that happens with a lot of interventions. This continued for upwards of 52 weeks with regard to lasting change. So I think that's really important that we know there's an intervention here that can at least last a year. A year. Do people need booster sessions? Potentially, but if we're engaging people in a practice and they begin to love it and they start to do it at home, then there's a good chance that obviously as they continue to train mindfulness, they'll continue to train all the um, cognitive processes that we're talking about today. And then finally, this is, a, this is really just a quote here on the bottom from the authors of this paper that mindfulness outperformed CBT. It was interesting to them that mindfulness outperformed CBT given the explicit focus of CBT on controlling or changing or modifying maladaptive thoughts and behavior. And it suggests that mindfulness training may uniquely buffer against future oriented catastrophic thinking. I think what they're really saying there is that people are aware when they go through a CBT type intervention that they're learning how to challenge and then change thoughts. But oftentimes with our patients who have chronic pain, those thoughts don't necessarily go away. But mindfulness is a way to buffer against negative thoughts, challenging thoughts, um, catastrophic thinking that comes back in the future. And we all know this, we know that all of us have some negative thoughts that will return um, even with significant CBT training or ACT training or mindfulness training. But when it returns, do our patients have the skills or not to um, cope with what happens? Um, and I believe that in training mindfulness, it's a nice way to do that. Um, again, there are lots of different types of mindfulness interventions. Um, Compassion-based interventions are one that we're starting to look at more and more with regard to chronic pain. These have shown um, positive outcomes with either brief single interventions or multi-session um, compassion type approaches. Um, when people hear about compassion, sometimes it seems a little um, weird to practitioners, I guess I can say, but it's actually very feasible and accessible for people who enter into this type of care. In essence, they're looking for a compassion focused approach. So people with pain are looking for practitioners who have been trained um, effectively with regard to compassion and empathy and mindfulness does that. Um, of course, has outcomes on many of the psychosocial variables, depression, anxiety. I think the most important one that we see here on the screen way down at the bottom is that it reduces feelings of isolation. 
So when we think about our chronic pain, um, you know, loved ones who are at home, and it's typical for them to um, move about and get out and get to engage with the community, and especially what's happened over the past year, just know that out of, you know, all the different techniques in mindfulness, compassion-based approaches may be best at this one particular aspect. We're still learning more, um, but the isolation part, which falls into that social category, is something we should all be concerned about. And compassion, which is a part of mindfulness and all my programs are, uh, is an evidence-based based way to approach that. Um, I just wanna to talk to the, the physical therapist for a moment and um, talk about mindfulness and phys physiotherapy or physical therapy. Um, Mindfulness training for healthcare pr practitioners has been looked at not only in physical therapists, but almost every other licensed health professional as well. This study was from 2019, again, a meta-analysis. I try to keep things on the higher level of research, but this showed data from over 38 randomized controlled trials, so about 2,500 participants, that with mindfulness training, there were small to medium gains in factors like anxiety, professional burnout, sleep, stress, depression. And I actually just spoke about this um, yesterday on a, um, on a podcast interview, um, not my podcast, someone else's podcast. I, I find it concerning that any professional, any licensed professional comes out of school and doesn't have some mindfulness training because of the amount of burnout that we see within um, healthcare professionals who are treating chronic pain. Now with that, um, this article, 2016, the Journal of Physical Therapy Education, for the PTs out there, you probably want to go into PubMed, and you can bookmark um, Professor Annette Wilgins. She is um, a professor of physical therapy, obviously, but she has begun to study mindfulness in physical therapy students and physical therapists. And what she's finding with that is that this is an acceptable approach for physical therapists to use both inside and outside the clinic. It minimizes stress. And that in essence, we should be including this in both our education, so the education of, of physical therapy students, as well as our practice as professionals. And I can tell you, um, I have a paper that's coming out, I hope it gets published, but actually I, I surveyed some PT schools and I asked some of these specific questions. We have a, right now as PTs, we have a very strong pain neuroscience education approach in our training, and that's important. But we need more mindfulness and acceptance-based approaches because those are the approaches that help our patients. And they also help us as well as professionals to buffer stress and anxiety that we come up against every day in practice. I can't say enough about this. I, I really think this is maybe the most important takeaway of why a licensed professional should train in mindfulness. We think about our patients, and that's important. We want to think about our patients. But um, as you train your own mindfulness and empathy, it'll help you. And in return, it helps your patients more effectively. So how much mindfulness training do we have to engage in? So just think to yourself right now, you may want to jot it down on a piece of paper. How, much, how many minutes of mindfulness is required to see a positive outcome. So this was a systematic review, 2019, right? very recent, looked at brief mindfulness-based interventions on many different types of health-related outcome, chronic pain being one of them, or pain being one of them. And what they found was, and this is a, quite a big study, 85 studies were all randomized controlled trials that all had robust methodology. So these are good quality studies. 85 is a lot in a um, systematic review. 79 reported significant positive effects on at least one or more health-related outcomes, such as things like anxiety, depression, emotion, stress, all the things that we've talked about today, right? So that, those were the results. The conclusion, when they looked at these brief interventions, was despite they looked at lots of different types of diagnosis, so there was a, a heterogeneous population of the sample here, that mindfulness-based interventions can impact numerous health-related outcomes after just one session of five minutes. 
So after just one session of five minutes, mindfulness has positive impacts on health-related outcomes. So you don't have to um, go on a meditation retreat for a whole week and sit and meditate for 40 minutes. If you're working and you're using this, and I hope all you will in the healthcare setting, as they say in the study, it may be appropriate to just start with five, min five minutes, right? That can be your initial step that can start to lead to those positive health outcomes. So just five minutes, I mean, just think about that for a minute. Who doesn't have five minutes where they can rearrange what they're doing with their patient, take out old interventions that are not working or interventions that are not working so well and just five minutes of mindfulness. So I just wanna to talk to my physical therapy colleagues for a minute who are beginning to look at psychosocial approaches to care. And they're saying, how do I do this? Where does this fit in? How do I fit this in with exercise? How do I fit this in with manual therapy? Um, you know, help me basically. The average physical therapist probably around the globe, I know this varies a little bit, but the average PT probably has about 30 minutes with the patient, okay? I look at it like this. The basic guidelines for exercise and physical activity fit into about 30 minutes, right? But our chronic pain patients cannot sustain, they can't tolerate 30 minutes of exercise, right? They may over time, we may work them up to that, right? But in the beginning of your PT session, based on the research that we just saw, can you include five minutes of a mental skills training, five minutes of mindfulness, if you will, and that leaves you 25 minutes at least to do all the other interventions you have to work with. Now, in my practice, I'm usually, I'm mostly using active interventions. Do I still use manual therapy? I do, but I really titrate it down for people. So you, as a physical therapist, you can use, let's say five or 10 minutes of this mental skills training that still leaves you with 20 to 25 minutes to work on the physical aspects of things. 20 to 25 minutes is a significant amount of time for someone to be exercising and moving if they're chronic, uh, you know, if they have chronic pain. Now, some of you may work in environments where you have a physical therapist assistant or an aide or a tech that works with you. So the exercise actually might continue after you've worked with that patient one-on-one. -on -one. So you may even be able to use, let's say, 15 minutes or 20 minutes of even mindfulness still and still have plenty of other time on this half to do exercise. So there's lots of different ways, of course, to manage your time and to treatment plan and include this into PT practice. And of course, you know, mental health practice as well. And, and if, you're, if you're a primary care provider, let's say you're an MD, again, five minutes might be useful for your practice. I'm a big proponent of brief interventions to begin with. I think they're useful for um, patients and they're useful for us as well. Now, as you start to build out, right, um, larger mindfulness-based interventions, and we look at what the data says with regard to longer interventions. So this one, um, 20 minutes just for four days. So not a lot of days, just 20 minutes for four days had an impact on pain intensity um, and pain unpleasantness in com compared to rest or in compared to a, a control, if you will. Again, it wasn't a, a whole 30 day program, just 20 minutes, four times. Now, as you move into the longer um, mindfulness training intervention, so this is 10 hours. So if, for example, if you meditated or engage in a mindfulness practice for 10 minutes every day for eight weeks, that would add up to about 10 hours. And then with that, then you start to see the changes in obviously the brain, the cortex with regard to nociception, with regard to the primary, primary uh, somatosensory cortex and engaging those reappraisal mechanisms that we're looking for. Uh, and then extensive training of greater than a thousand hours. These are long-term meditators. These are people um, who go through mindfulness training programs. That's when you begin to see kind of that deactivation of the prefrontal cortex and greater activation of the somatosensory cortex. And of course, reduced um, appraisal with regard to nociception or sensory ev events that people are um, struggling with in their body. But again, you don't have to, 
I'm not saying we need to work everyone up to a thousand hours. We definitely don't. I believe that the sweet spot with regard to med meditating or mindfulness training for our patients is somewhere between five and 10 minutes. Now, why would you choose mindfulness for a practitioner? It's relatively safe, requires no equipment. It impacts many conditions. It's a biopsychosocial intervention if you're looking for that. It can be delivered in brief, as I just showed you, five minutes or up to longer, full protocols if you're running groups or something like that. It, it complements, in my opinion, it complements many other therapies because it's that mental skills training along with the physical skills training. And then finally, it helps your own personal health and, and um, burnout. Now, what is all this paying attention in a particular way in the present moment? We talked about it helps with cognitive control, emotion regulation, self-awareness. It also helps with many other aspects. I don't have time to go in today, but these are the skills or the qualities, if you will, these are the qualities that people with pain are looking for in a practitioner. Now, if I had you all in a room right now, and I said, who, who as a, if you're a practitioner, raise your hand if you think you are not a compassionate practitioner, no one would raise their hand because everyone thinks they're compassionate. Everyone thinks they're empathetic. Everyone thinks they, you know, help embody what the, the, the patient's going through. And to a certain extent, that's true. We all have certain traits in us, but mindfulness, mindfulness training goes much deeper with training these skills and patients notice it. Patients notice when someone is appropriately compassionate. Patients notice when you're able to take their perspective and be aware and be in the present moment with them. This is vitally important for so many of our patients with chronic pain because so many of them struggle with adverse experiences either from early life or from just their chronic pain um, experience in general. And those adverse events, of course, are important for the person, right? Important for our patient, but when we train in mindfulness, we can bring these skills out into the community as well. So when you're looking at groups of people who are marginalized um, with regard to chronic pain, your LGBT community, um, women, people of color, children, you know, we can go down the list of people. These are all the populations that are in our practice. These are all the populations that are also in our community. Lots of community centers are looking for these types of skills. They want to bring um, well-trained, evidence-based mindfulness practitioners into centers, not just healthcare centers, but churches and schools and community centers to help um, train these qualities, if you will, so we can train them. We, these are desperately needed in our society today with regard to the social impact of, what everything, of what's happening that we see today. Um, people can be skeptical of mindfulness when they begin. So I, I started talking to a little bit of these, to, to how to overcome the skepticism that people have. So the first is call it a mental training. Don't call it mindfulness because mindfulness has a certain um, stigma attached to it as it is. You don't necessarily have to train with eyes open. You can in, instead, um, sorry, you don't have to train with eyes closed. You can also train with eyes open, meaning you can have someone just gaze down on a point on the floor or a candle or a pen, whatever it is. Um, share success stories of past patients or famous people who use mindfulness, many CEOs, heads of state, um, athletes, um, successful people choose mindfulness. I think number four is the most important part. I think it's why people um, opt out of mindfulness for lots of different reasons. But just like we grade exercise with our patients and we grade physical activity, we should grade mindfulness as well. So you go from a brief intervention of let's say one to five minutes to begin, and then you build it out to the larger 10, 20, potentially 30 minutes if you have the time to do that. I think that's really important because just like people are adversive to exercise and physical activity, they're also adversive to working with their own mind in the beginning. So when you dose it and you grade it appropriately, it helps people 
overcome the idea of, I don't want to kind of look at my thoughts. I, I don't, it's not a, a happy place for me to be, so to speak. Um, speak to the benefits. Always speak to benefits when you're working with patients. Um, if you're someone who relies on a referral from a physician or someone else, have them write on the prescription cognitive skills training. Because oftentimes patients see those prescriptions and it kind of plans to see that, okay, this is going to be part of, um, part of my therapy, if you will. And then combine it with other therapies in small ways. So here's my wrap for today. I appreciate all you guys hanging on. Um, we know that mindfulness has health benefits for both patients and practitioners. It's a useful intervention for psychologically informed care. It can be used in brief five minute interventions that create lasting change. It's trans transdiagnostic. It fits into PT practice in small doses, upwards of larger doses. I just showed you ways you can win over the skeptic. And of course, there's meta analyses looking at physical, um, outcomes as well as the psychological outcomes that we're looking to train and improve on in our patients with both with chronic pain and other chronic health conditions. So with that, I invite you to join a certification that I put together for professionals who treat chronic pain. And it's called the mindfulness based pain relief practitioner certification program. It is a seven week virtual training for any licensed health professional or wellness professional, whether you're a PT or a mental health professional, an OT, a, a psychologist, a fitness professional. Um, it's about 15 continuing education credits, so about 15 um, hours. And I provide you with a step-by-step -step training on how to use mindfulness to treat chronic pain, to cultivate a healthy mind, and to promote physical well-being. You can, um, I'm go we're gonna include the link right now in um, the chat thread. So you can click through to the page there and you can, um, hey Amanda, just click on that link there. Uh, put that link in there when you have a chance. Um, and the link is at the bottom there as well. So you can um, type that in on a, on a page there, integratedpainscienceinstitute.com forward slash mindfulness. And you can include that there and you can um, see um, what the program is all about. And I'm going to kind of walk you through what the program is as we move forward here. So the curriculum is, is broken down into seven weeks. I'll go through this week by week with you. Uh, the first week is the neuroscience of mindfulness. So we'll go into some of the basic neuroscience of um, what happens in the mind of someone who's meditating both the neurophysiology and looking at the cognitive change mechanisms and the pain neuromatrix. Uh, week two, we work on mindful reappraisal and how we start to work on the cognitive change that we're all aiming for. Week three is retraining the interoceptive network. So helping someone integrate their mind and their body together, helping someone integrate their bodily sensations in a way that's healthy, um, in a way that uh, promotes awareness and acceptance. So it's the first three weeks. Um, the next, so week four, we work on uh, cultivating emotional resilience and cognition. Week five are those compassion focused practices, helping people intentionally cultivate positive emotions, which help with that pain coping as well as uh, reducing practitioner fatigue. Uh, week six, probably the most important part that I think is left out of most mindfulness trainings, or they don't train it specifically, or shall I say, they don't intentionally train it. This has to be intentionally trained is working on the intention behavior relationship. So we have goal setting, right? We all know how to do that with patients. We have values. Values are kind of like the horizon that keep people moving in the direction. Intention is that moment by moment awareness of whether or not you're in line with your values and goals. The reason why people fail, as I mentioned before, is they get pulled out of the present moment and they have no way to reconnect to the intentions that are important to them. And then finally, in week seven, we're going to have a live um, virtual retreat for about two and a half hours, probably three hours. Things tend to go a little bit longer with me. Um, we're going to have a virtual retreat where I'm going to go into advanced practices for chronic pain. Uh, of course, talk about anything that happened in the program. And I'll provide you an opportunity 
um, volunteers this is not required, but I'll provide you an opportunity to um, train our group of professionals so you get some practice. It's very important that we practice these skills so you're ready to take them back to the clinic. It's great to go through a program, but I find with these um, cognitive behavioral skills that we need to practice um, with our peers first, and then we can move on and practice with um, our patients. Now, some of you know I have a new book out. Um, this book is the companion to this certification course. When you sign up today, You'll receive, of course, the, you'll receive the full course and certification, but I'm also gonna send you a free copy of my book. This book is a workbook. It's about hundred pages. So it's a wonderful companion on using mindfulness. You see this mindfulness in the subtitle there to learning mindfulness and then using mindfulness with your patients, whether that's an individual session or whether that's a group um, treatment that you're developing, a group treatment mindfulness session. Um, so of course, some of the metaphors, stories, Oftentimes we use that in group settings that's in the book um, and it's in the course as well, but it together, this is really what the training consists of. So you get that for free. And when you sign up today, we'll ship that to you. Um, so by the end of this certification and training, you'll be able to create your own seven week protocol, as I mentioned, either for individual or group treatment. You'll have over 35 mindful and cognitive exercises to use with patients. So there are 35 of these exercises in the program. There's another 40 in the book, okay? So 35 in the program, another 40 in the book. So I'm providing you with a lot. You won't need another mindfulness-based um, pain certification probably ever again. Um, I also provide you with scripts, both for short, medium, and long mindfulness meditation. So scripts are nice to use in the beginning, um, once you become a pro, you're not going to use scripts, but in the beginning, they're nice to have and nice to fall back and rely on. Um, you can go at your own pace. If you fall behind, you can catch up at any time. Once you purchase the course, it's yours for the life of the Institute, which means however long I'm in business for here, you have access to the course. Um, I plan on being in business for a very long time. I'm still a young, healthy male, and I'm going to be around for a long time. Um, if you can't make the retreat, that's okay. A replay will be available for the retreat as well. And in essence, I'm giving you a, a, an entire how-to system of mindfulness meditation. Um, I'm also including with this, in addition to the, the program and the book, um, a members-only VIP group so we can all connect with each other as you go through the program before we get to the seven-week virtual um, workshop. Again, transcripts of all the exercises, both audio as well as written. And again, by the end, you'll have a seven session, either group or individual protocol for brief, medium, and full interventions of mindfulness. Uh, and as I mentioned, unlimited access for the life of the Institute. So again, this is a snapshot at the curriculum. So I just boiled this down. These are the, you know, the, um, the titles of each week's content. This is what you'll be learning about in each week. The reason why I, snap, I snapshot this here for you and why I have this on here is because as I mentioned in that earlier slide that really any um, well put together uh, mindfulness training can help people with pain. However, based on my research, there are seven components to that training that have to be in with regard to mindfulness. So it's the foundational mindfulness of the breath, breath practices which you're gonna find in week one mindful reappraisal, which you find in week two, that retraining of the interoceptive network in week three, week four, enhancing emotional resilience, week five, compassion focused care, week six, the intention behavior relationship. And then finally, week seven um, will be the more advanced uh, pain meditations. Now, these have to be part of a mindfulness intervention if you plan on creating one. So don't just do mindfulness of the breath. That's not going to take people far enough. Over time, you have to progress, right? I mentioned that before. We have to grade this appropriately and progress it. And this is how we grade it appropriately and progress it. We move through these stages with patients, okay? Starting with basic, moving through reappraisal in the body to the emotions, to compassion, and then finally to intention behavior. This is your framework for the course. In essence, this will be your framework as you begin to use this with um, your patients. So completely based on the evidence, you get 35 exercises in the program, 
Plus you get another 40 to 50 in the book. I stopped counting at some point, but there's a lot here for you. Um, again, any practitioner can join. It's 15 CEUs. Um, CEUs are for physical therapists, occupational therapists, and health coaches at this time. I am working on other professionals, but if you need some help, I'm more than happy to provide you with some paperwork for other um, professionals to have this um, credentialed. Um, just $5.95 for this first cohort. Uh, for those of you that have been in my other programs, you know that um, I guess I can confidently say I produce high quality courses um, that provide you with what you need. Um, this will not be $5.95 forever. Um, I will increase the price later on. So um, today with this first cohort, I recommend you take advantage of it. Um, even if you're not going to start it today, it's going to be yours for a very, very long time. You can start it in a couple months from now if you want. Um, so that's what I have for you today. Um, there's the link there. I will take some questions. And I'm going to come out of this so I can uh, look at you guys here. Okay, hopefully you can all see me still. And let's see if I can find the questions. Okay, nice list of questions. So let's go through some questions first. So um, Petra asks, is yoga considered a mindfulness meditation? So yoga is a, is a form of movement and movement therapy, if you will, that does include some mindfulness in it if it's being taught um, the correct way. So there's lots of different yoga approaches. If you're taking a yoga class, for example, in a gym that has a more fitness approach or more fitness lean to it, it might not include as much mindfulness. If you're going to a traditional uh, yoga studio, you may find there's much, much more mindfulness that the instructor is including in their, um, in the instruction of the practice. And they may even include either at the beginning or the end, a five or 10 minute mindfulness um, practice. But yes, in general, Yes, yoga is a form of mindfulness. Um, Stephanie, can you talk about chronic lower back pain as clinical depression symptom and impact of mindfulness to attend to body mind regarding this study? If mentioned or known, please. I think you're talking about the, probably that randomized control trial that compared um, CBT versus um, mindfulness-based stress reduction. Um, you know, I think Stephanie, the the one thing to take into consideration is we have created a lot of different constructs around the difference between physical pain and emotional pain. Um, you see those in studies. Sometimes they look at depression and anxiety. Sometimes they don't. Sometimes they just look at um, pain interference. Um, I like to both look at, I like to say, or I, 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 I would like to see more studies that look at both outcomes such as depression and anxiety which are typically considered more of the, the negative psychological factors, as well as the more positive psychological factors of things like acceptance and awareness. I really would like to see the impact of both. I think if we can look at both, um, we have probably better studies and hopefully uh, more to lean on with regard to uh, using these interventions. How does mindfulness differ, differ from acceptance and commitment therapy? Excellent question. So acceptance and commitment therapy technically is a form of cognitive behavioral therapy. Mindfulness is technically not a form of cognitive behavioral therapy. However, the psychological community as well as others have geared, have, have moved toward it because it does have an impact on the mind and thinking. The big difference with regard to ACT and mindfulness is that ACT has a strong behavior change component to it. Um, the behavior change component in in ACT is based in values-based living and committed action. Those are the two processes there. One of my um, pet peeves with some traditional mindfulness that you might find, let's say in a mindfulness studio, is they don't talk about behavior, probably because they don't, it's not within their scope to do that. But when you train intention, intention trains many of the similar processes that help cultivate behavior change. So there are subtle differences, but there are definitely differences between the two. Um, good question though, there. Um, the biggest challenge I have facing treating chronic pain patients as a patient is patient's denial. It's been hard for me to take, take them to understanding central sensitization is real science. Mm -hmm. 
Often they say, I'm here for physical therapy and not to meditate. Insurance will not cover it, okay? Um, how would you address this problem? I think I spoke a little bit about that in saying that we train both, uh, when you come see me, we work on both mental skills training as well as physical skills training. So you don't ever have to use the word uh, mindfulness if you don't want to. Um, the word central sensitization, I don't ever use that with patients. I'm not sure if you're using that or not. Um, but a lot of people don't, um, it doesn't really hit well for them. So I don't necessarily use that. Um, now with regard to the billing part, if you're a PT and I know you are, um, you can bill mindfulness under 97112, which is neuromuscular education. That's a 15 minute code. So we're in neuromuscular education. So we're training the nervous system to help it re-engage with activities. Um, 97530, which is therapeutic activities, 15 minutes. And also 9860, which is patient self-management. Um, those are PT codes. Now the patient self-management code is 30 minutes. That's nice. So you have a 30 minute chunk of time that you can begin to explore mindfulness with someone in a PT setting. If not, you can just do, use the 15 minute codes and work on 15 minutes of mental skills training. Um, for those who are not only physical therapists, but other providers, you can also use the health behavior intervention code, which is 96158, and that's a 30 minute code as well. So there really is no barrier with regard to coding and billing with regard to this. Um, is the book for patients? Yes, the book is for patients too. Um, I actually write all my book, my, all, most of my books are what I call patient forward facing. So I write them for patients, but I also keep in mind the practitioner in there, meaning how can you use this book as a practitioner? This is a workbook. So it's only a hundred pages, right? It's a workbook. And if you look inside of it, um, for example, um, like a workbook, there are lots of things to um, fill in and lots of exercises and practices. So this is very user-friendly for both people living with pain as well as um, practitioners. And I really recommend that you go, or you provide this to your patient, let them read it. It's a nice way to start to talk about some of these concepts with them. My clients right now are all picking this book up and one of the first thing they do when they come see me now is they say, hey, I read like chapter four. And now we start talking about those concepts of mindfulness um, through their using the workbook. So. The workbook does some of the cognitive change for you, which is nice. Um, does this course take foundational training concepts from MBCT or MBSR? Um, to be honest with you, I don't know. I've never trained in, in mindfulness-based cognitive therapy. I've never trained in mindfulness-based stress reduction. I've trained in ACT and traditional mindfulness. So there'll be a little bit of a touch of, just a tiny little touch of ACT in here, very subtle. But most of this is, is rooted in a solid contemplative mindfulness approach um, for pain. Um, yes, if you're not a licensed professional, you can still be certified in this. So you may be a health coach or something else. You're more than welcome to join this training. Yes, everyone is welcome. Um, do you have thoughts on writing goals for incorporating mindfulness? I do, um, and I include that in the program, um, how to document mindfulness, um, specifically for PT practice, but it'll, it'll apply to mental health as well. Um, what does this say? Yes, you can use mindfulness with manual therapy, absolutely. Um, Yes, you can use mindfulness for trauma patients. Now with trauma patients, that's probably the one, um, not just the one, but one of the, the um, groups of, of patients you have to be a little bit cautious with because when they, for some people, when they begin to close their eyes, um, if they're a visual um, person, they start to see things and that can cause uh, challenges for them. So with trauma patients, I recommend first very, very short one to two minute interventions with eyes open, focused on a, a spot on the floor. And before you work with them, there's a lot of debrief about what, what this mental skills training is and what they can potentially expect. And if they don't feel comfortable, they can stop the practice at any time. So some, some um, psychoeducation has to happen first 
with regard to that population. Can I recommend you a book for your patient? Yes, this book here, Radical Relief. Excellent book for your patients as well as practitioners. Um, fibromyalgia, yes, very useful for. Um, goal setting, we can walk through that in the program. I go through all the documentation of how you can document um, mindfulness, uh, both in your plan of care, daily documentation, and, and I just mentioned some of the codes for you there. Um, yeah, so my courses for um, physical therapists are um, approved in like, I think we're like 42 states right now. Um, most states accept other states' credentials. So my recommendation for you is to take the certificate, um, take the invoice. If you need more information, I'm more than happy to provide you with um, a course summary and learning objectives and you submit it. I've never had anyone denied from any state with regard to PTs for any of my courses. Um, creating a perioperative pain science program for our ortho spine team. Have you had good success with mindfulness during acute post-op period? Yes. And it, mindfulness helps a lot of patients, not just um, post-operative, but also pre-operative. If you're working in environments where you can access people pre-operatively, um, that's one of the best ways to do it. Um, what outcome measures have you used post-intervention? You can use ACT-based um, interventions. You can use lots of, there's lots of different um, mindfulness-based interventions. I talk about a couple of them in the certification that you can use. Some of them are a little bit long. Um, some of them are quite easy and, and work with brief interventions. Um, if I don't use, so I don't use the term central sensitization with clients. What I tell clients is that there are things you're going to experience in your body with pain. And some of those things you experience with pain will have an impact on your thoughts and your mind. So we're gonna work with both your thoughts and mental training techniques, as well as your body. I mean, work with both. It's the best way to treat pain. And that's pretty much the, where I leave it. The word central sensitization is a, a, a challenging word that most practitioners can't even um, articulate in a, in a clinical research setting. Um, I think those are most of the questions. Um, anyone else? Any other questions? Anyone else in the chat thread? Um, I don't see much else there. Um, uh, the program starts today, well, when you purchase the program, good question. When you purchase the program, you'll have access to it today um, and starting right away. So it's starting this week. So this week is, is week one. So you have a whole seven days to work. I give you a little bit longer for week one. I give you probably about, I think, 10 days for week one, a little bit more content in week one. And um, yes, yeah, so it starts today um, when you purchase the course. Now the virtual retreat, I give you a little bit of leeway on that as well. Now, again, if you can't make the virtual retreat, it's fully recorded and we'll share the replay with you. You can access that replay at any time, but the virtual retreat will be March, uh, Saturday, March 13th at noon Eastern. Noon Eastern is a good time because it hits East Coast and West Coast and some people in um, Europe. And I always apologize to my Australia friends because they're oftentimes um, challenging for them to work on that, but noon is a good time. Um, you really should set aside about one and a half hours per week to work on this content. There is um, a didactic part of this, meaning obviously um, the training on the neuroscience. And then I provide mindfulness exercises each week that I would like you to engage in. So you train yourself on mindfulness. In each week, there are five different mindfulness exercises, anywhere between one, five, a bunch of 10 minute ones and some longer 20 minute ones. So I'll ask you to engage with some mindfulness as well to develop your own practice as you're going through the program. Um, yes, yeah, so you can use this in a group format. Um, I show you how to create a group format for mindfulness-based interventions, and you can use it in a community center.
Um, are the mindfulness exercises the same as ACT for chronic pain? Um, I think that just depends on who's using the exercises. So the answer is, is really no. With, with ACT, we're aiming for something different. With ACT, we're aiming really for values-based activity and behavior change. With mindfulness, we're working more with the mind. Now with that, there is behavior change that happens, but ACT is different than traditional mindfulness, than the traditional mindfulness approach. Um, the, I, as you know, I have an ACT course and you're welcome to join that one as well. And they reinforce each other. So my ACT course does reinforce the mindfulness-based pain reduction course, but they're different. They're not the same. So just because ACT is a mindfulness-based intervention, they're two separate courses. And in essence, I recommend you take both, but the mindfulness course helps reinforce the ACT and the ACT course helps reinforce the mindfulness. Any other questions that I haven't touched on? Um, any questions about like CUs or things like that, you can of course contact support at Integrated Pain Science Institute. We'll help you out with that. It is approved for physical therapist CEUs, OTs and health coaches, anyone else. Um, I can help you with, um, you know, with that approval, so to speak, we can give you the information. Um, so it's accredited for CEUs. When you're done with the training, um, you are certified in mindfulness-based pain relief. That certification is through the Integrated Pain Science Institute. There are, there are some quizzes and some testing through this. Um, they're not very challenging um, tests, but that, those quizzes have to be part of any continuing education course. And of course they are part of any certification, but, but it's, not, it's not killer. Um, you're not going to um, feel stressed out by taking this. In, in essence, you'll feel invigorated um, by taking this certification. If you already have a background in mindfulness, would you recommend taking your ACT course? Um, yes, I would. Like I said, the courses reinforce each other. And the, and the methods in essence reinforce each other. How long is each class and will classes be available online if I can't attend some classes? Yes, every, th this, is, this is an online program. So you're gonna have a unique username and password to access um, all the content. You can access it from a computer or from a smartphone. And I would set aside about an hour to an hour and a half a week to go through the material. Yes, the book has mindfulness exercises and I'm providing additional mindfulness exercises in the course. So it's not like I put the book online. The book is separate from the course. It's an additional training that you're receiving, okay? Uh, the codes 9711297530. Nine eight five six zero nine six one five eight. We go through all that in the in the, in the training as well. Um, if you are someone who has pain, um, just know that I have a mindfulness course or a mindfulness program coming out specifically for someone with pain. Um, so this is for practitioners. I have something specifically for people with pain coming out. I think that's about it. Um, how do you find a trained practitioner? Well, go to my website at the integrated pain science institute.com and go to the tab that says practitioners. And there are a number of professionals that are trained in the methods that I um, teach and their information is there. And then once this is over, we'll upload all the practitioner information of people who graduated from this certification with regard to mindfulness based pain relief. Um, I think that's about it. We're coming to the end. Um, post the link again. Um, Amanda, if you can post that link again for them in there so they have it. There you go. So that's the link there. So you'll click on that. It'll bring you to the certification page with some information that you can read through there. Everything is exactly what I spoke about today. 
with regard to the course, uh, with regard to the certification. Um, I'm going to wrap this up. If you have any questions, you can contact us, uh, us at support at integratedprainscienceinstitute.com. We may point you to the certification if it is um, a certification-based question, um, but we're here for you to provide support. And of course, I thank all of you for being here. I look forward to working with each of you in the certification course and in other courses that I have. Um, and just be well, move forward and continue to take good care of each other. Um, love what you're doing. Continue the good work. We need um, all of us online here um, helping people overcome chronic pain. Um, it's a really, it's a global movement. So I appreciate you all being here. Okay, go forward, love each other, live well, and I'll see you soon. Thanks, take care.